Uh, it's an honor uh, for me to introduce our next guest. Dr. Elizabeth Comney is one of the nation's foremost experts on China policy and strategy. She is the Hargrove Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Uh, prior to that, she was a Senior Advisor for China at the Department of Commerce for two years. And that was uh, for the Secretary uh, Gina Raimondo. So um, a little nice Rhode Island connection there. Uh, prior to that, she was the CV Star Senior Fellow and Director Asia Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations. She has written numerous books on China, including the latest, The World According to China, and she's written countless uh, published papers and articles, including the latest in the Foreign Affairs magazine titled China's Alternative Order and What America Should Learn From It. Uh, she's earned her BA with honors from Swarthmore College, her master's from Stanford, and her PhD from the University of Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Economy. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for that uh, very nice introduction. And thank you also for inviting me here, and President Garvin also, uh, for inviting me back to the Naval War College uh, to speak with such a, a great and distinguished group of military uh, thinkers and leaders. Uh, so I am going to talk about China, um, in particular China's ambitions on the global stage. And I'll share some of my thoughts about uh, the US uh, response, um, particularly from the perspective of having worked in the Commerce Department for the past few years. But I'm going to start by taking you back uh, to 2001, when China was just on the cusp of its accession to the World Trade Organization. And at that time, then Senator uh, Joe Biden was traveling in China, and he said, the United States welcomes China's emergence as a great power because great powers adhere to international norms. About two decades later, however, President Joe Biden offered a very different assessment. He said, we have to push back against the Chinese government's abuses and coercion that undercut the foundation of the international economic system. Everyone must play by the same rules. I think President Biden's two statements really bookend both the promise and the ultimate failure of US support for more than three decades of engagement policy. This policy was premised on the idea that if the United States encouraged China's entry into the international community, into the system of international institutions and norms, that that process, along with the rise of China's middle class, would accelerate economic and political liberalization in China and make China what Deputy Secretary of State uh, Bob Zelik called a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Instead today, I think most US officials and analysts would argue that China has moved in a radically different direction. It has reversed its process of economic reform and opening and challenged elements of the international system. The result is a US-China relationship that is more complex, more competitive, and much more challenging, I would argue, than at any time since normalization of relations in 1979. Of course, it takes two to tango, and both countries are to some extent responsible for the challenging environment in the relationship. But I'd like to quote my friend, uh, Dr. Wang Jisa, who is one of China's leading scholars of US-China relations. And he said in an interview in 2018 in the FT, for over 200 years, the United States has never changed its goals for its relations with China, the free flow of information and values. Chinese have always had reservations or impose, imposed boycotts to oppose these two goals. We should criticize and have reason to criticize the United States, but we should realize that China's own actions have changed Sino-US relations and US perceptions of China. If we are looking for the cause, it was the change in Chinese policy that led to adjustments in US policy toward China. US policy changed because China changed. So how and why has China changed? I think there were really two important inflection points uh, in the past decade and a half or so. The first was in 2008 when China hosted the Olympics and the US hosted the global financial crisis. The Olympics, of course, was China's great coming out party. It announced to the world that China had emerged as a great power. 
At the same time, the United States was mired uh, in the global financial crisis. And there was a moment when, and it's a now oft-told story, when Premier Wang Qishan, uh, who was a senior most uh, economic official in China, said to Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, you know, you used to be our teacher, Hank, but we're not sure we have anything to learn from you anymore. And I think that moment, you know, China had looked to the United States as its economic model, and at that moment, uh, that changed, right? The, China began to think that maybe the U.S. didn't have it all figured out. It also began to think that that process whereby China assumed that eventually its economy was going to surpass that of the United States, that that was happening at a much faster pace than it had originally anticipated, because it didn't expect the United States to rebound from the global financial crisis. It began to talk about the, United, about the world needing to move away from the dollar as the world's reserve currency. And we began to see a more assertive China uh, in the security realm as well. You may recall back in 2010 uh, at the ASEAN Defense Ministers Conference, uh, when then Foreign Minister Yang Jiechi said to the Singaporean Foreign Minister, you know, we are a big country, you are just small countries, and that's a fact. I think the second uh, inflection point, and arguably the most important, was the advent of Xi Jinping. Uh, first as General Secretary of the Communist Party in 2012, and then President of the country in 2013. I think he was a real game changer. From the moment that he took power, he began to talk about the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Now, all Chinese leaders uh, and Communist Party leaders have talked about the revival of China, the rejuvenation of China. But Xi Jinping was really the, the first Chinese leader who brought both the vision uh, along with the capabilities to affect uh, a great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And what did that mean in his mind? I think domestically, he defined it as having a robust Chinese Communist Party at the forefront of the political system, a people's liberation army that was capable of fighting and winning wars, and a modern Chinese economy that was peer to the Germans, the Americans, and the Japanese. On the international front, uh, it was really about reclaiming a, a greater degree of Chinese centrality on the global stage. Uh, back in 2017, when he was reselected as General Secretary of the Communist Party for his second five-year term, uh, he said, he uttered a, a phrase uh, in his speech where he said, China has stood up, grown rich, become strong, and now, basically in his tenure, is moving towards center stage. I want to make clear that from my perspective, and not everybody shares this perspective, Xi Jinping's ambitions are transformative. They are not reform around the margins. This is not simply about creating a safe space for China as an autocracy. In any case, when you do that, I would argue you make the world safer, unsafe for a democracy. But this is really about reordering the world order. And I think this process is taking place across five dimensions. First, and I think most important to Xi Jinping, is redrawing the very map of China to reflect the territories that he considers to be Chinese sovereign territory. This includes, uh, in the first instance, China's core interest, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the South China Sea, but also the Diaoyu Senkaku Islands uh, that are administered by Japan. Obviously, we had the border conflict with India. There's territory in Bhutan and Nepal, even territory in Russia. In some cases, uh, China, makes just political statements about its territorial claims. For example, uh, last year it, it mentioned to Russia uh, that uh, Russia should start to identify the Chinese territories within Russia using their Chinese names. Uh, in other cases, there are kind of quiet land grabs, as in Bhutan, where all of a sudden you find China developing settlements inside Bhutan and then pushing Bhutan for some form of a political settlement. But of course, what we see most often, I think, is the military assertiveness and aggression, uh, you know, the border conflict, uh, the deadly border conflict with India back in 2020 at the height of COVID, and more recently, the very uh, uh, significant uh, military activity around uh, the Philippines and Taiwan, very highly destabilizing uh, actions. So I think just, just to understand, to begin with, in Xi Jinping's mind, right, in the world in, in the 21st century, China has a much larger land mass territory as well as a maritime domain. His second strategic priority uh, is to move the United States out as the dominant power in the Asia Pacific. Uh, He's fond of saying Asia is for Asians to govern, and of course he does not mean Japan and India, he means China, 
Uh, he calls often, as many Chinese officials do, for the end of the US-led alliance system. Uh, he says it's anachronistic, a relic of the Cold War, targeted against China. Recently, there's a Chinese military official who said that the alliances uh, represent the selfish geopolitical interests of the United States. China has its own semi-security organization in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which mostly has uh, countries from Eurasia and, and South Asia. Um, uh, and they, you know, were started as a kind of anti-terrorism organization, but you know, do joint military exercises together. Uh, China also has a trade organization that it has established, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in the region, uh, that in, uh, encompasses 15 countries and 30% of global GDP. All that being said, I think, uh, it will be a heavy lift for China to push the United States out uh, of, of Asia as the dominant military power, uh, if only because um, uh, other countries in Asia want uh, the United States to be there. Uh, Nonetheless, I think uh, looking at the trajectory that China is on, I think it's going to require the United States and all of its allies and partners to uh, invest more in uh, their military resources and capabilities uh, if, in fact, we're going to remain competitive because China uh, is devoting significant resources and, of course, has geographic uh, advantage. But I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about that in the next, uh, from the next set of speakers. Um, China's third strategic objective is is to embed its own values and interests and policy priorities uh, in other countries, to have other countries align their policies with those of China. And I think um, here it, it's leveraged its economy, it, the strength of its market, quite effectively. And it uses it both to incentivize but also to coerce. On the carrot side, on the incentive side, I think the most significant initiative is certainly the Belt and Road Initiative, which is Xi Jinping's flagship foreign policy initiative. It began, as I'm sure you all know, in 2013 as a hard infrastructure initiative to connect China to about 65 countries across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa through ports and railroads and highways. Um, you know, there were three maritime routes and three overland routes. Um, it was designed in part to uh, fill a legitimate infrastructure gap uh, that the world uh, was facing, especially in developing um, uh, emerging and middle income economies, but also to export China's overcapacity in the construction industry and to connect some of China's lesser developed regions uh, to external markets. But since 2013, we've seen the Belt and Road morph into something much bigger. Uh, there's now a digital Silk Road, fiber optic cables, e-commerce, you know, uh, satellite systems, uh, cloud computing, uh, 5G. Uh, there's the Health Silk Road, which really blossomed during COVID. And you saw China exporting traditional Chinese medicine centers and its e-health technology. And of course, the Green Silk Road, which now we're, we're experiencing uh, full throttle uh, with the export of solar panels, wind turbines, and uh, EVs and, and batteries. Um, so there's a, a whole array of, of uh, Silk Roads that are all designed to do essentially the same thing. All told, to date, China has uh, financed or invested uh, over a trillion dollars uh, through its Belt uh, and Road um, projects. Of course, there's been some backlash against the Belt and Road uh, for reasons of lack of transparency in governance, for the debt issues that we've heard a lot about. Uh, there have been environmental protests, um, and just a, a lack of social responsibility uh, and, and in many of the projects. Um, so, so it hasn't it hasn't had necessarily the positive, imp the completely positive impact that I think the Chinese uh, government wanted. Um, and we've also seen just last year they held their third Belt and Road Forum, where they said, you know, they're going to be pulling back from many of the large infrastructure projects, and small is beautiful, right? That was the tagline for the conference. Partly, that's also a result of the Chinese economy slowing down. But I think we sh as we look forward, we should look uh, to see that China is probably going to invest most uh, in mining and minerals, especially in areas related to the green transition. I think a continued emphasis on the digital Silk Road, and then in uh, infrastructure that has uh, strong security uh, applications like ports. Um, there's also a political uh, component to the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So um, in 2017, uh, again, when Xi Jinping was uh, reselected for his second term as uh, general secretary, uh, he talked about, for the first time, China as having a model that other countries 
could or even should emulate, for countries that were disaffected by the models of the United States and other market democracies. Uh, and at first, that it produced quite a firestorm, a firestorm inside China, where a lot of officials said, no, he didn't really mean what he said, because the idea that China would have a model to export is something the Chinese government has always resisted, um, and certainly a firestorm in the United States in the analytical community. Um, so the, the, the talk quieted down, but then a year later, he was back at it. And it's clear uh, that China is now uh, seeking ways to export its, uh, its political values. And by export, this is not the same as the Soviet Union. China is not imposing these values, but it is offering them up to, to interested and willing partners. So if you're a member of the Belt and Road, uh, you can take a cybersecurity training seminar that will teach you how to you know, monitor the internet and control dissent. Uh, China has has a couple of political training centers, one in Guangxi province, where Southeast Asian leaders can come to be trained on the China model, and one more recent uh, that it's established in Tanzania for six African countries. And so part of this is you can learn how to do poverty alleviation, you know, improve local agriculture, but it's also how do you have a strong one-party state, how do you control a civil society. And of course, there's a, a security uh, element to this. Um, China established its first military logistics base in Djibouti. It's developing military facilities of some sort in Cambodia. Uh, I think there are there's talk of, of new military facilities in Equatorial Guinea and the UAE. I think eight or nine um, other uh, countries. Uh, there, and again, this is something. If, if you were to look back in Chinese Communist Party history since 1949, you know, the idea of China establishing bases was just antithetical uh, to party you know, dogma. It wasn't really until 2011, 2012, when you started to see some scholars begin to say, why shouldn't we have bases overseas? And now Xi Jinping has made this uh, a reality. And China also has you know, police training centers that they've set up in other countries, um, which gives it an added security presence sometimes. Like they set one up in, they set up a police station in New York City. Of course, nobody in New York knew that they were doing that until late. And, and finally, it was investigated and the, the people were uh, thrown out. Um, but this, again, gives China a greater sort of security foothold uh, across the world. On the coercion side of things, um, you know, China, since probably 2010, 2011, uh, has used the leverage of its market, its economic power, uh, to try to coerce other countries to uh, do things that it wants in the political realm. Uh, so, uh, you know, when the Philippines was being problematic about the South China Sea, China banned the import of Philippine bananas. Uh, we saw, you know, the sort of soft ban on rare earths exports to Japan. There have been many, many occasions uh, since about 2011, 2012, when we've seen these kinds of actions. But I think there was a pivotal moment in 2019 when uh, some of you may recall the general manager of the Houston Rockets, Daryl Morey, tweeted, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. And, uh, and you know, I think the Chinese government responded, you know, somewhat uh, in an expected manner. They pulled the merchandise um, of the Houston Rockets from the shelves uh, in China, uh, but then you know they banned, uh, they stopped televising uh, all of the NBA games for a little bit over a year. But for me, what was most important was a statement that was made by CCTV, China Central Television. They said issues that relate uh, to national security. Uh, and, uh, and political stability do not fall within uh, the purview of freedom of speech. And you know, the, the idea that China would try to control uh, the speech of people outside its borders on anything related to political stability. You know, pr previously, the line had always been, as long as you don't cross you know, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the South China Sea, you're pretty much OK. But now China was saying, whatever we don't like, whatever we deem that you say that undermines our political stability, you're going to face some kind of punishment. And so then we saw Australia being punished for uh, its call to investigate the origins of COVID. The Wall Street Journal had its journalists expelled because they had an article that had a title that said China was the sick man of Asia. So a much more expansive view or, or belief in China about what they should be able to uh, control on the global stage.
Then the fourth strategic priority, um, which I think is often ignored, um, uh, maybe not so much now, but, but certainly historically, is China's efforts to transform norms uh, and international institutions. Um, so when Xi Jinping uh, gave a speech, he gave a speech in 2014, and he said China should lead in the reform of global governance institutions. It should not only write the rules of the game, but it should create the playgrounds on which those games are played. And that speech was largely ignored. He actually gave it to a big group of, of scientific officials. Um, but I, I noticed it, and I thought, you know, this seems a little interesting. And we've seen over the course of his tenure just a massive effort by China within the United Nations and other international institutions to change the rules of the game. In particular, I think around human rights, uh, where China uh, has an alternative view of human rights, uh, that you know, economic development should be a prerequisite for individual uh, political and civil rights. They now have a new civilization initiative uh, that says any country should be able to determine its own conception uh, of human rights. This obviously uh, flies directly in the face of uh, UN Charter. Um, they are, have been proposing for the past several years through Huawei in, in technical st st standard setting bodies, a kind of kill switch uh, in terms of reformulating internet governance so that the state uh, would be able to uh, turn off the connection to any device anywhere in the country uh, that's connected to the internet. So if you're typing something that they don't like, click, your internet is off. Uh, so that's another initiative which so far hasn't uh, made any progress. They've spent an enormous amount of time and energy getting the Belt and Road Initiative written into more than two dozen UN agencies and programs. And you may not think it's that important, but like who cares whether the, you know, a certain the World Health Organization says, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is important for our work, um, or Interpol says we take as a priority protecting, you know, Belt and Road Initiatives. Uh, but I think it's important in two ways. Number one, you're using international resources for things that are purely Chinese domestic priorities. And second, there's there's a, a, a good example of ch where China uses this as a coercive um, as a coercive uh, sort of tool. Um, in 2019, uh, there was a bill to reauthorize, reauthorize the UN mission to Afghanistan, and China said, unless you include uh, Belt and Road Initiative in this, we're going to veto it. And it had been included for the past several years, uh, but the U.S., Germany, I think Indonesia pushed back and said, no, we're not going to include it. And the Chinese threatened again to veto it. And they said, no, we're not going to include it. And then the Chinese backed down. Uh, so the, the way that China plays with this, the way that it tries to use international institutions to advance its own interests, its own views, I think is quite troubling. Um, and, and I think there's a, a mandate that we, we need to understand. There's a mandate from Beijing that Chinese officials, who are technically international civil servants in the United Nations, that they are called upon to be agents of advancing Chinese interests within the United Nations. So just one more example. Um, there, Dolkan Issa, who's the head of the World Uyghur Congress um, and was going to testify in the United Nations, and the head of the body that he was going to testify before was a Chinese official. They oversaw the body. It was a Chinese official. And he had Dolkan Issa removed physically from the hallways of the United Nations. He had security guards come and take him away, even though he was legitimately you know, tagged to, to be there, had him moved away. And then that Chinese official went on Chinese television and actually boasted about what he had done and said that, you know, as a UN official, I view my primary objective as serving the motherland's interests. So I think we really have to pay attention to, um, to how China tries to use uh, the UN to, to advance its own domestic interests. They often pay for major studies uh, on the Belt and Road that of course have positive implications and they feed back into things. And it's quite strategic, in many respects very um, brilliant. Uh, I think in the past couple of years, we've seen new initiatives like the Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Civilization Initiative, a big push on de-dollarization that I think we need to wake up to here in the United States. Uh, but I guess the point that I really want to make is I would think about this as a kind of multi-level strategy, where China takes its own development model, its own policies and priorities, 
pushes them through the Belt and Road Initiative, and then tries to cement them in these international institutions uh, and um, uh, organizations. And then finally, the fifth uh, dimension uh, of China's strategy uh, is really just transforming the relationship between the Chinese economy and the global economy. Uh, and in 2020, Xi Jinping uh, announced a new policy of dual circulation. And what that basically means is that China believes it has the capacity to innovate, uh, manufacture and consume all within itself because it's such a large economy. It will continue to export, of course, uh, to the rest of the world, and it will encourage dependency of multinationals uh, for parts of their supply chain within China. Xi Jinping has said explicitly that he sees this as a source of uh, Chinese political leverage to have business communities dependent uh, on the Chinese economy. Um, but by and large, China wants to insulate itself from the pressures of the global economy uh, while making the global economy uh, continue to be dependent on um, China. So let me just switch now and spend a couple of minutes talking about um, the U.S. response uh, and uh, sort of what it's meant for uh, the China-U.S. relationship, this transformation in uh, Chinese policy. Uh, I think um, that it clearly has had uh, an extremely important, uh, it has a set of important implications for U.S.-China relations. I think it's made the relationship much more explicitly competitive. Um, it's not just that China is charting its own economic path, uh, but now a political path that it is trying to export globally. Uh, the range of contentious issues that the United States and China now deal with is expanded probably hundredfold. It used to be that we were really just focused on trade, Taiwan, and human rights. Right? We had a, an overall cooperative relationship where we just sort of needed to manage those three issues. Now, uh, as I think I've uh, sort of laid out, uh, we're on, uh, we're, our conflicts range across you know, every dimension of, of policy. Uh, China also has adopted a very zero-sum uh, approach to the U.S.-China relationship, and it's something that they accuse the U.S. of doing. But with their rhetoric around the East is rising, the West is declining, or socialism uh, will triumph over capitalism, that doesn't leave much room for what they often like to call their win-win uh, solution. Really, they, there is one winner, and that winner uh, is going to be China. Uh, I think China also cost itself uh, support within the U.S. Uh, from, from important groups. And in many respects, this, this support was cost by actions that it took domestically. So China passed a, a law on the management of foreign NGOs uh, that limited the number of uh, U.S. and other non-governmental organizations that could engage in China. So it went from over 7,000 before 2017 to about 400 after 2017. And you know, civil society in the United States, environmental groups and educational groups, health uh, organizations had been very active in China and were an important source, a kind of pillar of support for a more robust and proactive China policy. Uh, but China really undermined that group. And the second is the business community. Uh, and we've witnessed, uh, I think, a pretty significant retrenchment in business interest. And you can look at any of the recent surveys uh, done by the Chamber, by the U.S.-China Business Council, to see the drop in uh, plans for new investment in China, or is China your top place for future investment? Um, that there's been a significant retrenchment uh, in U.S. business interest in China. And part of that, of course, is, is due to U.S. policy, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it also has to do with changes on the ground that China has made, uh, you know, making it much more difficult, much more threatening environment, calling consultants, Western consultancies spy agencies, uh, limiting the data, the flow of data, limiting the economic information that you know, businesses can have access to. So this is a second group. Really, those were the two main pillars of support for a proactive policy, the business community and civil society, uh, when times got challenging in the overall bilateral relationship. Uh, and those two groups really don't play that role anymore. Uh, so again, I think it contributes to a much more conflictual model. And I think that the final point about why this relationship has become such uh, so much more difficult um, is that the United States is no longer willing to be patient with China. You know, for many, many years, and I've been you know, working on China 
for three decades now. And for most of that time, um, you would hear business people and US officials say you know, about Chinese intellectual property theft, for example, or other bad actions uh, that, OK, you know, yes, we're going to take action, but they're still a developing country. They're learning. We're still the model. They're going to get there one day. When China has its own IP to protect, it'll do a better job. And that's all gone. There's no more patience for China. China's economy is too big, uh, it's too competitive, uh, and so there's no, there's no more uh, willingness to wait around for China to come and do the right thing. There's no belief that, that that's the, the path that China is on. So what does US policy look like? Um, I think you know we've seen a significant evolution. I'm just going to say quickly. I think uh, the Obama administration, I, the sort of around 2011 with the, the pivot or the rebalance, I think that marked a change from what I would call an engage but hedge strategy to a hedge but engage. Right. So the, there was a new a new understanding of China and the threat that it was presenting. Uh, in large part, I would say on the military side, but we also started the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. You know, we believe that we. Had had been missing out on the dynamism of Asia, but also China's military assertiveness was, you know, starting to to resonate with us. So we also need to move more of our, as you know well, uh, of our uh, military assets uh, to the Asia Pacific and away from the Middle East. Um, but. The Obama administration still wanted to engage. We wanted China's cooperation on climate change. We wanted it on cyber economic espionage. So there was there was that duality, but just maybe a little bit as a, of a switch in emphasis. The Trump administration, I think, represented the foundational shift in how the United States uh, looked at China. Really, 180 degrees engagement was dead, uh, and we were really moving into a kind of compete, counter, and contain. China was recognized as you know, a near-peer economic and military uh, competitor, and I think as both the uh, Trump and Biden administrations would say, uh, you know, the greatest long-term strategic challenge that the U.S. Uh, confronts. Um, you know, took a number of, of measures like the tariffs, uh, the, you know, pushing the idea of clean networks. They bolstered the Quad. Um, so there was a, a, as I said, a foundational shift in the Trump administration. The Biden administration, and here's where I'll just, I'll, I'll finish up. Um, I think the Biden administration has both built um, and expanded upon that foundational shift and also redressed some of the mistakes that were made by the Trump administration. The Biden administration policy is, you know, is sort of termed managed <coughs> competition. <clears throat> Um, and I think for the first two and a half years, what that really meant was that we were working to develop the uh, necessary capabilities to compete effectively in the 21st century. So this was what Secretary of State Blinken, when he gave his big China speech um, in May of 2022, he said, invest, align, compete. So we're investing in ourselves. This is the Chips and Science Act. It's the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the you know, sort of green energy transition. Uh, it's the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is going to bring broadband to you know, everybody in the country. This was really about building back the innovation and manufacturing capabilities of the United States, again, to enable us to compete effectively with China in the 21st century. Uh, then the... Uh, compete side of it, and I'll say, I'll, I'll offer this from the uh, commerce perspective. Um, obviously, it has a military and a political component, too. But from commerce, I think we understood it really as modernizing our economic tools that would enable us to protect our economy, our economic and national security, as well as our competitiveness. Um, from uh, from China, so that means modernizing our export controls. So you know, we make export controls not only about the actual technology, but about know-how. Uh, there are new outbound investment restrictions. We always had inbound through CFIUS, but now uh, there's an executive order on outbound that targets a couple of high priority te technologies like quantum and AI. I think the final rule is due sometime uh, this year. Um, it's basically saying to companies, we don't want you going out and investing in companies in countries of concern, of which, of course, China is, is a major one, uh, in these areas, because these are technologies that China could develop that would uh, eventually undermine our national, could eventually undermine our national security. Supply chain resiliency. I mean, this really came about because of COVID. And Secretary Raimondo, 
uh, who, uh, as Mike mentioned, was a former governor here, uh, talks about the time when she was governor and she, during COVID, and she was calling around to Japan and South Korea and asking for PPE. Uh, personal protective equipment, right, that, that we so desperately needed here and was nowhere to be found. So how do we ensure that we're not overly dependent on any one source, any one country or entity for the goods and, um, you know, raw materials that we need uh, for our own uh, security? And I think here, and it's a point that we've made to the Chinese on a number of occasions, you know, it's not about, it's not necessarily just about China. I mean, our, our biggest uh, over-dependence and concern right now is with Taiwan and, and semiconductors. Um, so there's an enormous, enormous effort uh, in the US government now on looking at various supply chains and, and trying to figure out where we are too uh, dependent um, on other countries, but in, of course, in particular on, on China. Um, Tariffs, uh, obviously the Biden administration maintained the tariffs and just uh, added a set of, of new tariffs. Um, I will leave that alone. Um, and uh, I will say one of the uh, uh, things that has been most rewarding uh, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, during the time that I was at Commerce, is looking at the partnership between the business community and uh, the government. And I would say that when I first got there, uh, there were uh, people in the US government who, and there still are, um, who uh, are more concerned about the business community than they are supportive of the business community. Um, uh, and, and I think part of what uh, the work that we did at the Commerce Department was to help others in the US government understand that a lot of business just, they're patriotic actors. And so we would bring in CEOs and other people from other parts of the government uh, for seminars uh, where the business community would basically say, you know, CEOs would stand up and say, listen, just give us clarity, give us consistency. You know, we're American companies. You know, we want to do what's right. Just, you know, give us the guidance. Uh, and we found that the business community has been essential, not only in things like Chips and Science Act, but in other initiatives that we've put forward, like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. You know, 14 companies step up to do digital skilling in the emerging economies of Southeast Asia, um, just at the behest of, you know, the secretary. So it's really been, I think, um, quite uh, uplifting uh, to see that partnership uh, develop uh, and evolve. And then the final part of the uh, Biden administration uh, strategy is the align. And that, of course, is uh, working with allies and partners, uh, establishing new institutions like the US-EU Trade and Technology Council, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which I just mentioned, um, you know, the Quad Critical and Emerging Technologies Working Group working with the G7. And if you look across all of these organizations, all of these partnerships, what you find is that there's probably a 70% overlap in the issues that they are addressing. So all of them are probably talking in one form or another about digital trade, talking about AI, uh, talking about supply chains, talking about the green transition. You know, some of them are talking about economic coercion, some of them are talking about export controls and others are not. But, but for the most part, we're trying to weave a kind of net of agreements, right, through all of these institutions so that our principles, our, our partnerships are all aligned uh, in ways that I think, frankly, you know, represent core American uh, interests. Um, so, and I, oh, well, I should say, the other thing that we've done that was different from, or I should say the Biden administration, since I'm not in the administration anymore, the other thing that the administration has done I think that's important is get back involved in the uh, international organizations. And so uh, for the first time in 70 years, for example, uh, the U.S. holds the top position in the International Telecommunications Union, um, which does a lot of technical standard setting. It's very important. And this was a position that was for the previous two terms held by a, a Chinese official. Um, and I think that in some ways is probably the biggest shift uh, from the Trump administration is that emphasis on partnerships and international institutions. Then finally, um, you know, after I think uh, the administration put in place all of these building blocks of the competitive strategy, uh, there was a notion that we ought to do a little bit more on the cooperative side of things. And that's why you saw the flurry of uh, secretaries going to China last summer. Uh, uh, I think Secretary Blinken, Yellen, Kerry, and then uh, Secretary Raimondo went. I can tell you that uh, the trip there 
I think on any front was considered to be successful, the Secretary's trip. We had very good meetings. The Chinese interlocutors were quite gracious. They refrained from any sort of polemical discussions of Taiwan. There was not one mention of Xi Jinping thought. Uh, it was all very um, just focused on the economic issues. At the same time, there was a little bit of an air of, of unreality to it. So every Chinese leader from the premier on down uh, would say, you know, we want American business back. We're holding these roundtable sessions. We're listening to their complaints. And the secretary would say, you're not getting American business back unless you change what you're doing on the ground, right? unless you develop a, a, a business environment uh, that is uh, welcoming to them. Uh, and we're not changing our policies because national security is our top priority. Um, you know, we, we had four working groups come out of, of, the, um, of, the, of the visit, and I, I think a lot of good intentions and goodwill. But I would say overall, as we're looking at the relationship, what we have is a very thin veneer of cooperation, a desire on both sides not to see the relationship devolve into kinetic conflict, but beyond that, I don't think either side has much hope or belief that we're going to get some new grand bargain or any truly impressive gains in, in a cooperative, um, in, in sort of cooperative uh, agreements. Um, so I'm just gonna finish with a couple of thoughts on what I think the administration might do moving forward, which is my way of saying what we might do better. <laughs> Um, I think first, uh, probably there's a need to clarify uh, sort of what we're doing on behalf of economic and national security and economic competitiveness. You know, export controls, outbound investment restrictions, all of these things, tariffs have all be become conflated so that the narrative is basically the United States is just trying to prevent the Chinese economy from growing. And I think that's a dangerous narrative. It's one that the Chinese are eager to grab onto. Um, and uh, it's one that will cause our allies and partners, as well as many other countries, uh, not to want to work with us. And so I think we need to be very clear when we take the actions that we do, why we're doing them. Is this on the grounds of national security? Is it on the grounds of economic security, right? Supply chain resiliency. Is it on grounds of economic competitiveness, right? China has created an unlevel playing field and we're taking actions to redress that. These are different things. Uh, and I think we need to be clear about why we're doing what we're doing. I think second, and I, I think the administration has begun to do this, is we need to move beyond working with our traditional allies and partners. There was a lot of restorative work to do uh, after the Trump administration in terms of building back up those relationships. Uh, but I think we've missed a lot in terms of not so much in Asia, but in Africa and Latin America. We need to do a better job. I think we need to do a better job of bringing them into the kind of work we're doing on supply chain resiliency uh, and, and make them feel part of our vision for the 21st century. It shouldn't be all about Asia and our, and our European uh, partners. Um, when, uh, uh, the secretary traveled to Kenya. I went with her just uh, not so long ago. And um, uh, we uh, worked with the Kenyan government to develop a set of governance principles around artificial intelligence. And why did we do that? Because too often we do these things in the G7 or you know in other fora. We come up with these rules and principles, and then we take them to the emerging and middle-income economies and say, here, you should just sign on to this. We figured it all out. Just sign on, sign up. So I think we need to do more of the reaching out to these countries, bringing them to the table when decisions are being made. Uh, and I think that's uh, I think something that China has done uh, a lot of in the past and has done better than we have, and, and we need to do a better job there. We need a trade agenda. I'll put that to the side. Um, and then just I think maybe it's worth remembering. Um, you know, we treat China as this monolith, and and I you know have done that in this talk, talking about China on the global stage. But you know, if you peel back, uh, you know the the onion, however that expression is, um, I think you find that China has within China as many different uh, views and perspectives on any given issue as the United States does. There are enormous range of issue. Nor, there's an enormous range of views, for example, within China on China's uh, uh, support for Russia. 
Um, so a lot of dissenting opinions out there if you take the time to look. So I just would like to end with a cautionary note that we don't close the door to China. Uh, China is not static. There's always the potential for change, for China to uh, move on a different trajectory. And so we always need to keep the door open uh, to that possibility. Thank you very much. Thank you.